Okay, I make the time two o'clock. Good afternoon. Welcome everybody. Board of Health meeting, February the 6th, 2018. It's most my daughter's birthday today. My goodness. Learn something every day. Uh, okay. All righty. Um, I, I know that Councillor, or sorry, I shouldn't say Councillor, Board Member Michael Columbus is uh, absent this afternoon, evening. He is on personal business. And I'm not sure of Board Member Brunn. I assume he'll be along shortly. I don't know. Again, always a reminder, we're web stream, we're televised as usual. My cell phone is on silence, so that's good. And Judy Ann McCauley, we all know her. She, again, is looking after uh, our broadcast this afternoon as our camera volunteer. Thank you very much, Ju Judy Ann. It is appreciated. Disclosure of pecuniary interest. Are there any to declare on this afternoon's agenda? I don't hear of any. I will ask you to look at page three if you wish. Uh, it's our January the 9th Board of Health minutes. If there's anything that needs to be corrected, now is the time. If not, I will uh, declare them to be adopted as they are printed. Councillor, sorry, Mr. Wells. So through um, the mayor to Councillor Wells, uh, I believe you're referring to the homelessness report um, and that would not be part of the Board of Health, so that'll be coming later this afternoon. Okay. And uh, okay, okay, we have so we have executed that direction though. Okay. No, that's, that's good. There's no, no apology needed. We're here to uh, keep you straight, Councillor Wells. No, uh, no problem there. Okay, I'm going to now uh, declare those uh, minutes of January the 9th uh, adopted as they are printed. I'm going to staff reports, item 3. Um, Dr. Locke is here. This is uh, his moment uh, uh, to give us uh, a medical consultant update. Consultant now. My goodness, you got a different title every time I bump into you. Anyhow, we're, we're quite interested to hear what you have. Uh, thank, you, thank, uh, you. thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Okay, so uh, the local situation at the present time with regards to outbreaks um, are, as you see uh, on the sheet there, these may be slightly out of date because they change from week to week and uh, I'll prepare the report a little bit earlier. And, and just um, for your interest as a Board of Health, um, I've noted there are some of the pressures on staffing when these uh, outbreaks occur, both um, enteric diarrhea type uh, outbreaks and also the respiratory outbreaks. And because um, they're working on um, low numbers of staff, uh, there can be quite an impact on getting coverage for staff uh, in these situations. Um, as regards to the current flu status, um, overall now we're seeing um, quite, uh, across Canada, quite um, heavy uh, flu activity. Uh, but there are some signs uh, across the country that it's beginning to slow. Um, and the majority of, um, of the circulating strain is the A strain, uh, H3N2 variety. And, um, however, it's a little bit unusual this year because 40% of the isolates that we're seeing uh, are also influenza B. Um, I remind you that normally we see two waves of um, flu coming through. Um, the first wave comes through and then approximately six weeks later we get a second wave, which is the, the second wave is usually more uh, associated with B, but this year we're seeing it um, very early. Um, so, um, the, a Canadian study has reported that um, the mid-season estimates of influenza vaccine is a 42% overall uh, 
<coughs> effectiveness, so that's good news. Um, and I think I reported to the board before that um, the, uh, the low incidence of uh, ineffectiveness of the uh, H3N2 variety that's in the strain this year is only sitting around 17%. However, um, the, the B strain uh, that's included is a very good match to the vaccine, so um, we're still seeing some... Um, uh, effectiveness of the current vaccine for that reason. Uh, I've included a map there just to show you the activity across across the nation, and um, you can see that Ontario is one of the uh, one of the um, uh, heavy widespread activity uh, with regards to flu. So uh, we're still looking at that. There was an interesting report this week uh, on um, antibiotic resistance, which I thought it would be important for, for you to understand. Uh, the WHO uh, for, released this. This is the first report that they've released on antibiotic resistance across the world. And of course, um, we're very concerned about this because the number of antibiotics that we can use uh, with multi-resistant organisms um, become very uh, depleted. So we only have um, a, a few antibiotics. And the most reported commonly uh, common bacteria is um, E. coli. E. coli, as you know, is mainly a, um, a urinary tract uh, infector. Uh, and basically um, <clears throat> that has been known to be one of the high resistant um, strains of bacteria out there. And some other ones there which cause um, Klebsiella, which pneumonia, which is one of the uh, bacterial um, or bacteria that cause pneumonia, and also Staphylococcus, Staphylococcus aureus, which is um, present on all of our skin, etc., and causes wound infections such as uh, boils and uh, acne, uh, secondary infections from the skin. Um, and Salmonella species, uh, we've not seen a lot of um, resistance to Salmonella, but as you're well aware, uh, Salmonella is very uh, common. Um, and we come across it, and unfortunately, if we see any of these outbreaks uh, uh, with a resistant organism like this, uh, we could end up in um, quite serious trouble with regards to treating it. Um, and that's my, uh, my month's report, uh, Mr. Chair, and any questions I'll be pleased to address. Very much, Doctor, for the update. Uh, Councilor Broughton, welcome. To the Board of Health meeting, any, any uh, pecuniary interest to declare? No, thank you. Good to see you. I'll go to questions now. Uh, Mr. Black, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and through you to Dr. Locke. And um, I'm always confused, and I think everybody is confused about the whole idea of incubation period or when an individual is infectious or <coughs> contagious. Uh, how do you tell that? Is it you've got in here like five days? Somebody should be, you know, from the first onset of uh, uh, symptoms, uh, it shouldn't be going to work for like five mm -hmm. days. So is that sort? Is that the incubation period? Uh, how do you tell? Can you talk well, about the incubation <clears throat> period and contagious and stuff like that? This varies from organism to organism and varies from uh, bacterial to um, viral. Um, incubation periods have uh, long been established for most of the diseases that are known. Um, and as you say, uh, there is a period where you're infected and there's an, a period when you're infectious. So you could be infected with something, um, a virus we'll say initially, and you have the virus, it's already circulating and it's uh, already propagating itself within you but at that point it's not reached the respiratory system or whatever. Whichever way it's propagated, um, it's not uh, got to your respiratory system so that if you're coughing, you then become infectious. So uh, even though you're infected yourself, there's a delay between the time that, that infection then gets to a, um, a level of uh, development that you now become infectious to others. There's no, uh, I mean, it, it varies from, it varies up to 14 days. can be, um, you know, uh, people, depending on what it is uh, and how you're infected, 
um, uh, you know, you can have a, a seven to, to 14 days, 10 days, uh, you can be uh, infectious, but uh, you may be infected long before that. You know, and people don't know that they're infected, but they can be contagious. So it's, that makes it very difficult to, to send people home from work, like they're at work, they're healthy, and, and yet, hey, they're coughing and spreading the disease with, without really knowing. And that's the exact reason why we see influenza spreading in populated areas and places. Um, when, uh, when you go to a, a shopping mall, for instance, you may be feeling well, but you may be in that, that crossover period between being infected and infectious, and you're already spreading it. So um, uh, it's, um, as I say, it depends from organism to organism uh, what that period is. But um, <clears throat> there's an infectivity of organisms too. Um, in the statistical and mathematical world, they talk about an R naught. R naught is the number of people that if a person was placed in a susceptible group, how many people they would infect in a period of time. So that varies, that, that infectiousness also varies from, from person to person. And in the childhood illnesses, which we're really concerned about, uh, mumps, for instance, uh, you can have a very, you can have someone sitting in your, your waiting room and infect everybody in the waiting room within a half an hour of being there. So it's very infectious, and others are not so infectious. Tuberculosis is not that infectious. You have to have quite considerable exposure to TB in order to get infected. I think I'm going to invest in one of those uh, um, infectious-free bubbles and start wiring it. Okay. Uh, sorry, I... I uh, the, <laughs> The mic, the mic thing jumped off, and I, <laughs> I didn't hear. It. Was that a question? Sorry. <laughs> I don't even know if it's worth repeating. <laughs> oh, any other uh, questions? I guess for Dr. Locke. Okay, it's been moved by Well, seconded by Oliver, that this medical update be received as information. Any discussion? I hear none. Those in favor, carried. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Locke. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. The thoughts of putting uh, Mr. Block in a bubble. Mm. Yeah. Th th thinking about that one. Let's go on to staff reports. I'm on page 7. Food security in Haldeman, Norfolk, 2017. This is staff report 1802. So, um, Ms. Miranda, I'm going to turn this report over to you and see what you do with it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to uh, reintroduce uh, Ms. Laura Goyet, one of our public health uh, dietitians, who's going to present uh, the report for us this Thank afternoon. You. Thank you. The purpose of this report is to provide results of the 2017 Nutritious Food Basket Survey, present an opportunity for advocacy, and to provide an update on the future of NFB under the modernized Ontario Public Health Standards. As you are aware, health units are mandated under the 2008 Ontario Public Health Standards to monitor food affordability in our region, and we do this by completing the Nutritious Food Basket Costing Tool. NFB is a measure of the cost of eating a basic healthy diet. Prior to providing an update about the future of NFB, I will um, provide the results of the 2017 survey. So the 2017 Nutritious Food Basket survey results reveal that the monthly cost of food for a family of four in Haldeman and Norfolk counties is $868.47. This data is used in conjunction with rental rates to determine the adequacy of income from both wages and social assistance. The analysis found in Table 1 on page 2 of the report reveals that households earning a median Ontario income would spend 22% of their income on rent and food. Individuals and households living on minimum wage or social assistance would allocate 53 to 109% of their income on rent and food. A positive finding this year was that individuals and households with children did see an increase in income left over after paying for food and rent, on average about 9%, and this is in part due to increases in the Canada Child Benefit. Individuals without children, however, do not receive this benefit, and therefore advocacy is still needed for people in these situations. For example, a single male on Ontario Works would go $67 in debt every month after paying for food and rent only, leaving no money for any other expenses. 
Food insecurity is a public health concern. Adults who lack access to healthy food have poor physical and mental health and are more likely to suffer from chronic conditions such as diabetes, high blood pressure, and anxiety. Children who are severely food insecure are at a greater risk of asthma, depression, and suicidal ideation in adolescents. Poverty is the root cause of food insecurity, and therefore targeted and sustainable approaches to addressing poverty are needed, including improved income security and increased access to affordable housing. In October of 2017, a report titled Income Security, a Roadmap for Change was released, providing a 10-year roadmap for income security reform in Ontario. The report includes several recommendations, to highlight a few, establishing a minimum income standard in Ontario, an immediate increase to social assistance rates, and making essential health care benefits available for all low-income individuals. This report was presented in HS 1742 to inform Council and request an opportunity to provide feedback from the social services perspective. Today this report is being presented acknowledging the significant impact the recommendations could have on health, as addressing income and housing has a direct impact on household food insecurity. Moving forward, in 2018, the Health Unit is planning to adapt the No Money for Food is Senseless campaign, originally developed by the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit. The goal of this campaign is to raise community awareness of household food insecurity, the impact on health, and the need for income-based policy solutions. The campaign also engages the community and builds local capacity for action. In terms of the future of nutritious food basket, the modernized Ontario Public Health Standards, effective January 1st of this year, did not include the NFB protocol. The requirement to monitor food affordability still remains. However, now it is under the revised Population Health Assessment and Surveillance Protocol 2018. Essentially what this means is that health units are still mandated to collect this data, but will not be mandated to use a specific tool or protocol. A standardized protocol and guidance document would ensure that a consistent methodology is used to collect this community level data. Food affordability data is currently a powerful advocacy tool that supports program and policy development related to equity, poverty, and food insecurity. An inconsistent methodology between health units may result in an increased workload for staff to create data sets that lack year-to-year -year comparability. So in summary, 2017 NFB data reveal an increase in income for households with children. However, ongoing advocacy is still needed to ensure that all individuals and households have an income that provides enough money for both rent and food. Income solutions, including the recommendations in the Income Security Report, are an effective way to reduce rates of food insecurity. And lastly, while health units are still mandated to monitor food affordability under the modernized Ontario Public Health Standards, a specific protocol and guidance document, such as NFB, is still needed to ensure that all health units are using a consistent methodology to collect this data. Thank you, and with that overview, I would be happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you. Very well presented. Uh, there will be questions. I will start with Mr. Wells. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you very much for the report. And I think you are correct, Mr. Mayor. It's done very well. So my comment or question has nothing to do with the way the report is presented. Every year, we always have this report, and it, we've had it for numerous years that I've been on council. And I guess my question is a pretty simple one. Do and it's done with, obviously, considerable cost, because there is staff time, and staff time costs money, we know that. Does it help anyone? I mean, how does it help the person that's $67 a month in the hole? So that's my question. Is it helping anybody with, for the money that we've invested? Are we getting good results? Good meaning helpful results. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So through the chair to the Board of Health, uh, we are mandated to monitor food affordability under the Ontario Public Health Standards um, 2018. And uh, this data is used to advocate for, um, for income adequacy. So in the past, there has been, uh, the past two years specifically, we've advocated for increased uh, social assistance rates and income responses to food insecurity, including a basic income guarantee. Uh, that has been piloted at the provincial level currently. Um, so I think we are hopeful that in the, in the future we will see decreased rates of food insecurity in our region. Uh, unfortunately, we won't have that data until 2019. 
so we will monitor that next year. Um, but to answer your question, food insecurity is, is a result of poverty, and poverty is a very large and complex uh, problem which needs to be tackled from multiple angles. And I think year after year, we do collect this data and it goes towards advocacy. And um, I am hopeful that hopefully we, we will be coming to a time where we will be seeing decreased rates of food insecurity in our region. Mr. Oliver. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and, and I add my thanks for, this, for the report. It's a good one. I have two or three questions, but they're all fairly short, I think. First of all, with respect to the uh, cost of the nutritious food basket for 2017, you've reported to us $868 and change, and that's a relative amount. Uh, the question then is, what was it the year before, and does a drop in the cost of the nutritious food basket in any way contribute to that 9% increase on average income for the family? So through the chair to the Board of Health, uh, the cost of the nutritious food basket last year was $12.56 less than this year. So there was a decrease of 1.4%. Um, so that $12 would, um, would have a small effect in the amount of money left over. However, if we look at that in, um, in comparison to something like the Canada Child Benefit, which increases income by about $300 for those families, it is quite insignificant. And so that's why we focus our advocacy on income instead of um, changing food costs, because we don't have much control there. I, I understand that, and I, and I agree with you, but I guess uh, can we take some encouragement from the fact that there was such a marginal increase year over year to the cost of the nutritious uh, food basket, I guess? Uh, $12 over, uh, as a percentage over of 856 is pretty good, actually. It's not too bad. And, and for a family who, um, who has limited income of uh, absolutely $12.56 would make a, a difference. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. And my second question, Mr. Chairman, relates to this NFB protocol 2014. I'm reminded of how one of our senior governments at one point decided to do away with the long-form census. And all of a sudden, we lost four or six years of valuable, consistent data. And now I fear we're going to start doing exactly the same thing with respect to monitoring uh, access to food and the cost of healthy food. So I won't ask you to try and explain why the province chose to take that protocol out, but is there any reason why we as a, as a health unit and as a board of health and our neighbors, can we just continue to use that protocol ourselves? And is that something staff are planning to do? Through the chair to the board of health. Without a protocol, technically a health unit could, could collect that data any way they Please. However, there is a provincial group of dietitians who is collaborating right now to um, likely use the same protocol this year to collect that data since we are still mandated to collect it. Um, however, it is based on the food guide and so with upcoming changes to the food guide it might be something that again that group would look at altering uh, in the future but we could still use that protocol to guide our data collection for this year, absolutely. You could or you intend to? We intend to. Thank you. Mr. Height, please. Thank you, Chairman Luca. Uh, through you to staff, uh, I noticed here on uh, the chart on page 14, the, the, it's a very nice chart actually. It's easy to see this way. And what I'm curious about is I see that the minimum wage earning, you've used the 11, dollars and 40 cents per hour rate as opposed to the current rate so I'm just wondering how that affects the does it have any effect on the Canada child benefit or the Ontario trillion benefit now that they're they would be earning more money through the chair to the Board of Health um, so this data is collected in May of 2017 and so we used uh, the minimum wage from May of 2017 but in 2018 we will be using that um, increased number of $14 per hour so that the way that the Canada Child Benefit is structured is that at 
$30,000 a year of annual household income, it starts to be adjusted um, to ensure that the lowest, uh, lower income families and households receive more than a, a higher income um, household and family. So it may be adjusted slightly for minimum wage earners. However, um, they'll still be receiving kind of that maximum that they could. It wouldn't be that they would fall into a category where they would lose a significant amount of money through that benefit. Okay, thank you for that. Now, so with the new minimum wage, they still wouldn't make over the 30K per year, is that correct? So with the new minimum wage, it would depend if they were a full-time income, a full-time minimum wage earner, um, their income would actually fall just above, sorry, I'm just checking. Yeah, so they, they would make over $30,000 a year, that, that situation, but they actually do anyways right now. Um, so they would still receive a, a large portion of that benefit. It's structured in a way that kind of does um, low income earners, kind of moderate and high income earners. So they would still fall in that low income category. Okay, thank you for that. Any other questions on 1802? Okay, thank you very much, Laura. Moved by Walls, seconded by Oliver. The staff report, HSS 1802, the food insecurity for Holloman Norfolk 2017 be received as information. And that the Board of Health read a letter to the Minister of Community and Social Services in support of the report, Income Security, a Roadmap for Change. And further, that the Board of Health read a letter to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care in support of continued monitoring of food affordability by public health units through a standardized protocol and guidance document under the modernized Ontario Public Health Standards Requirements for Program Services and Accountability and further that the staff report be forwarded to Ontario Boards of Health. Discussion on that recommendation. Those in favor? Carried, thank you. We'll move on to page 17, staff report, 1803. <clears throat> These are the wonderful results of our survey from board members. I'm sure that uh, uh, Marlene will have lots to uh, talk about here, like, who left the question blank? That's my question. <laughs> Who skipped over the question? It's probably me, Marlene. I'm Thank kidding. you, Mr. Chair. I will confirm that nobody left it blank and everybody answered the question. So um, thank you for that. Um, this report is, as um, the board is aware, uh, a follow-up to the health audit recommendations, and the purpose of the report is to share the results of the self-evaluation and to summarize the recommendations and seek board endorsement. It should be noted that the analysis of your package is based on the nine members of the Board of Health, since that is the direction of the audit recommendation. It, when we replicate the results with inclusion of the advisory committee uh, submissions, it does change the numbers, but not the outcome of the analysis. Based on the review of the priority areas and open-ended question responses, staff are making three recommendations for endorsements from the board. First, creation and delivery of a comprehensive Board of Health orientation program beginning in January of 2019 with a potentially new board uh, with content sufficient to establish a solid understanding of Board of Health and staff responsibilities in mandated program delivery. A modular format will allow for customization based on the specific needs of the Board of Health. Second, participation in an annual retreat with the Board of Health and staff from the health unit. Agendas will be developed to include program reviews from various staff and program areas, provincial mandated program updates, as well as an overview of LIN priorities and the role of the health unit within the LIN context. These sessions will be scheduled to include specific topics, including governance training, public health funding structures, and expectations. Invitations to the annual retreat will, at the discretion of the Board of Health, be extended to Haldeman Council and senior staff in an effort to increase involvement and understanding of the issues. And thirdly, the assessment of the, of the effectiveness of the new, um, newly developed subcommittees of the Board of Health in providing the Board of Health with sufficient information and discussion to assess and oversee performance. This assessment will occur formally on an annual basis, again beginning in 2019. 
Development for the delivery of these recommendations will be completed with substantial input from the Quality and Risk Subcommittee of, this, uh, of the Board of Health. And with that context, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Marlene. Any questions on these survey results? <coughs> Height and then Oliver, please. Mr. Thank Height. you, Chairman Luke. Uh, through you to staff, you, you, on the second one, you're talking about a retreat. Is that the, and that's in the budget already? Uh, through the mayor to Councillor Height, this will be into 2018. So as we're developing what that would look like, we would definitely incorporate that into the budget for 2019, recognizing that we'll have a, a potentially different Board of Health um, due to the municipal elections. Okay, thank you for that. And, and your first one was the orientation, and you were going to put that in on January. You're going to have to schedule around all the different budget meetings and things like that. Is there... Wouldn't it be better maybe to wait till February? Um, so through the chair to Councillor Height, we will seek direction from the board and we'll, we'll populate the, um, the orientation and then we'll, we'll determine what that schedule looks like um, that will be convenient for board members. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Oliver. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Mine is a comment more than a question. But sure. I do want to comment on the first two recommendations and perhaps even most particularly the second one around the annual retreat. And just to support this, and I realize I won't be here to, to take part, and I'm, I'm, I regret that, but I recall a couple of years ago, I think it was, at least two, when we as councillors or Board of Health members were invited to, be, to take part in the strategic planning process, which the health unit did. And I remember going to at least one of the full day sessions and I found it extremely valuable and, and quite honestly a good experience to be there and interacting with staff as part of that exercise, which I think is not dissimilar to what you might be contemplating here with the annual retreat. So I think it's a really good idea and uh, I think it will be valuable to all parties that would be involved. Thank you for those comments. Any further comments or questions? <clears throat> Thank you, Marlene, for that. Moved by Well, seconded by Oliver. That this staff report 1803, Board of Health self-evaluation results and recommendations be received as information, and that the Board of Health for the Haldeman Norfolk Health Unit endorse proposed recommendations to address priority areas noted by members through their responses to the self-evaluation. Any further discussion? Not those in favor. That is carried. Thank you. On to communications, we have three A, B, and C. <clears throat> First communication is from uh, Michelle Line, uh, our program manager concerning alcohol use and harms in Haldeman and Norfolk counties. Second is a report of the Rowan's Law Advisory Committee from the Regional Municipality of German, uh, Durham. And thirdly, secure a kiosk set up for needle disposal. Marlene, anything you want to comment on those before we deal? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, staff is prepared to answer any questions, or if there's any um, specific communications you like presentation, staff are prepared to do that as well. Thank you. And to board members, uh, questions. Uh, uh, we'll start with Mr. Black, please. Yes, I attended this uh, get-together in, in uh, Jarvis, and I thought it was very interesting the information the speakers um, and something that I think that does need to be addressed um, but wondering I, I know with my own experiences in alcohol in high school like it started there and would you be focusing on um, like high school kids uh, uh, drinking behaviors and um, peer pressure you know I mean it's the same alcohol and drugs or whatever it may be, peer, peer pressure is uh, uh, a large influence. Uh, I just wondered if, uh, to me, that seems to be a place that you need to start with alcohol, cigarettes, all of those things. So um, would that be happening? Through the chair. Um, so alcohol uh, is very ubiqui ubiquitous in nature and it's a socially acceptable part of uh, our society. And uh, education awareness on its own 
is not uh, going to um, make the change that is necessary uh, in order to um, make an effective, uh, healthy public policy. We also need to look at prevention, which would focus on uh, high school students as well. But as well as we also need to look at, uh, you know, uh, availability of alcohol, as well as enforcement, as well as treatment options. Any other questions? I have one, and certainly I didn't read all of the report that's here in the fine print. But on page 49, it's uh, interesting in the conclusion, I always do read the conclusions, that it says here that <clears throat> the drinking patterns and rates in Haldeman and Norfolk counties, outlet, alcohol outlet density in residents, drinking patterns and rates are higher than the provincial average. Well, we know down here we like to smoke and we like to consume alcohol, and that's that's done all over the country. What what do we mean by the, if I may, the um, drinking patterns and rates? It, it, do we do we get this by the amount of uh, alcohol that is sold through our our breweries and, and our LCBO? Is that primarily where we? determine that, if you will, please? Uh, so through the chair, so if uh, we're talking about the uh, alcohol outlet density, we do, uh, we looked at uh, outlets that uh, are in the Cancer Care Ontario report and uh, they mapped out uh, the alcohol density per 10,000 uh, people aged 15 and older. Yes. And uh, in Ontario, it was, uh, in 2014, it was 17.4. For uh, Haldeman and Norfolk, it was 20 for every 10,000 people okay. aged uh, 15 and older. And these alcohol outlets, they include on-premise and off-premise outlets. So on-premise outlets, it includes bars, clubs, and restaurants, whereas the off-premise outlets include uh, liquor stores, beer stores, grocery stores, breweries, and wineries. So currently, uh, we, uh, we got information from the AGCO, the Alcohol Gaming Commission of Ontario. So there are currently 59 licensed establishments in Haldeman County and 114 in Norfolk County, which includes wineries and breweries and distilleries. Uh, but these numbers do not capture alcohol retail outlets such as the beer, sport, uh, beer store and LCBO. So it's per 10,000 Per 10,000, okay, thank you. Any other questions on the report or the communication? Anything else on the other two? Moved by Wells, seconded by Oliver, that our communications item A through C be received as information. Discussion on the motion to receive? If not, those in favor? It's carried. We thank you for that. Onwards, we do have a closed uh, session, and this is in regards to an update on the medical officer health re uh, recruitment process. <clears throat> it has been moved by Geisens and seconded by Oliver. That the Board of Health move in, into a closed session at 2.38 p.m. to discuss matters pursuant to section 239 2b of the municipal act 2001 so 2001 c25 as the subject matter pertains to personnel matters about an identifiable individual including municipal or local board members those in favor we will now move to closed session as the board thank you
It's been moved by Councillor, uh, sorry, by Mr. Height, seconded by Mr. Geisen, that the Board of Health adjourn this closed session matter at 2.51 p.m. and reconvene in open session. Those in favor of reconvening, we are now out of closed session. The Board was uh, given an update on the progress of recruitment of uh, a medical officer of health for Haldeman Norfolk. So nothing further to report uh, at this time. Any other business to come before this board on our February meeting? If not, I'll get to the confirming bylaw. I'm sorry, there was somebody. Oh, <laughs> sorry, I, I should have looked over there. Should have known. Go ahead. Uh, other business? Thank you, yeah, uh, thank Mr. You. Chair. Just a quick um, other business. Um, we do have a flyer here before me um, that you're invited to a presentation on a newly released report on alcohol use and the harms in Haldeman Norfolk counties. And it is on Wednesday, February the 28th from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. at the Simcoe Health Unit at 12 Gilbertson Drive. So if anyone is interested, that is an open invitation. Thank you. Um, Stephanie, please. Thank you through the chair. Just a reminder that the next Board of Health meeting will be scheduled for March 20th. And the reason for that is because of the uh, two, two week um, shutdown for council and the Board of Health in March. So the next Board of Health is March 20th. Thank you for that. Anything else under other business? Moved by Mr. Black, seconded by Mr. Geisen. So that bylaw 2018-03BH. Being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Board of Health of Haldeman Norfolk Health Unit be passed, signed by the Mayor and Clerk, and affixed with the corporate seal. Those in favor? Board of, that's carried. Board of Health is now adjourned. Thank you. Iris will kill me when she sees that. That's okay. That's what I do. Nice and warm. All for you. Thank you.